morning, everyone. Our service for the 16th of January will begin in a few moments. spiritual communion brought to you by Christ Church Bora Bear in Beaconsfield. A very warm welcome to all of you who are joining us from wherever you are in your home. Uh, and I hope that even though we are physically separated, that uh, you'll feel connected spiritually to 
all the other members of the body of Christ this morning. Uh, Karen won't be assisting us this morning. She had uh, winter-related car, car issues, but otherwise she's doing okay. We will uh, sing our opening hymn. That's Common Praise 162, Sing of God Made Manifest. Uh, and if you, uh, if you wish, you can stand at home and sing. The words will be in front of the screen.
Almighty God, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world. May your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, shine with the radiance of his glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our service continues with the readings from Holy Scripture. Our first reading is from Isaiah chapter 62, verses 1 to 5. For Zion's sake, I will not be silent, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest, until her vindication shines out like the dawn, and her salvation like a burning torch. The nation shall see your vindication, and all the kings your glory and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called my delight is in her and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm is the Psalm 36, 5 through 10. We are going to uh, say it responsibly. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens. And your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the strong mountains. Your justice like the great deep. You save both man and beast, O Lord. How priceless is your love, O God! Your people take refuge under the shadow of your wings. They feast upon the abundance of your house. You give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the well of life, and in your the light we life. see light. Continue your loving kindness to those who know you. And your favor to those who are true of heart. And together we pray. God of justice and of mercy, open the eyes of sinners that they may see the light of your truth, know the power of your love, and share in the bounty of your heavenly table. Through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Our second reading is from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of services, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, and to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of 
All this activates by one and the same Spirit, who allows to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out, and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants knew the, the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Holy Trinity, the source of all, the incarnate Word, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Today's gospel lesson recounts an episode that is well known to all of us, and in some form, I would say, known to the wider public. If you just say, wedding at Cana, all but those fairly familiar with the Bible will not be sure what you're talking about. But if you say, Jesus changing water into wine, then everyone gets the reference. So well known is this particular element of this Bible story that this has become one of Jesus' trademark miracles, as it were, along with walking on water and very likely even surpassing the multiplication of bread and fish. It's even given rise to some comical memes, these little funny things you see on social media. Recently on Facebook, I saw one such meme that had a picture of a store shelf in a grocery store, I think, with the, self, the shelf had the label water. But the, on the, sh the shelves that were labeled water, there were, were standing bottles of wine. And the caption read, Jesus was here. And, and another one I saw uh, showed a picture of a, a wine glass filled with water, and right beside it, a little Jesus figurine. And the caption read, now we wait. The comedic opportunities afforded by this passage are numerous, especially at uh, church or clergy parties. But all kidding aside, the fact is that many people see this story in a sort of caricatural way. It's like, ooh, there wasn't enough wine, and then poof, Jesus magically makes more. As if God became incarnate in human flesh just to show up at a party and make more booze. As if he's performing a very impressive parlor trick. Yes, it's very impressive as magic tricks go. But it seems kind of trivial, kind of banal as a miracle. I mean, it feels like a miracle should be something more, more significant, a problem should be solving a problem more significant than a problem that could be resolved by a quick trip down to the Debanar. Even Moses had the Nile and all the water in Egypt turned into blood, a more impressive feat than producing a few jars of alcohol. Regrettably, our literalistic way of thinking, and this trend is only intensified in modern times, has tended to make us interpret these deeply symbolic stories in such a way that places emphasis on the act itself, rather than the meaning the act conveys. As a result, these signs and wonders described in the Gospels become something to believe in as literal historical fact, or on the other extreme, something to be rejected as mere fairy tale. I think there are quite a few people out there who feel they can't be a Christian because they can't accept everything in the Bible as literal history. And indeed, if that were a requirement, I wouldn't be standing up here. But see, these stories are not included in the gospel just to impress us, to make us see, to say, wow, Jesus must be God incarnate because he can walk on water and change water into wine. Because honestly, Jesus is not the first person in the Bible to perform works of wonder. Many prophets before him performed healings and other deeds we'd call miraculous. So the signs and wonders themselves do not distinguish Jesus as anything more than a great prophet. The point of these stories is not to amaze us or thrill us, but rather to tell us something about who Jesus is and what Jesus means for us right here and right now. As famous as the wedding at Cana story is to us, it appears in only one of the four Gospels. 
the Gospel of John. And the fact that it appears in John's Gospel, and only in John, should be a big red flashing sign that this story is highly symbolic and probably a bit mystical as well, because that's what John's all about. While the other Gospel writers are concerned with presenting a chronological, historical narrative, John just chucks chronology out the window because he is most concerned with presenting a theological and spiritual portrait of Jesus, Jesus as the Word incarnate. So everything in John's Gospel is driving toward this purpose of presenting the symbolism of who Christ is and what Christ means for us personally. What else do we know about this episode uh, of, of marriage at Cana? Significantly, this is Jesus' first miracle. In fact, it's his first public act after his baptism in John's Gospel. Now, I just used the word miracle, but actually this is an inappropriate term in the context of John. John never uses the word miracle. Rather, he uses the word sign. And the word sign clues us into the purpose of these acts. They're not just deeds of power meant to impress, but acts that point to Jesus' true identity as the Word of God in human flesh. And as further proof that John did not just include these miracle or sign stories in the Gospel randomly, just got, as if, you know, in the order they happened. The number of the signs in John's Gospel is seven. Jesus performs seven signs in John's Gospel. No more, no less. And that's another big flashing red sign. If you ever encounter the number seven in the Bible, it's sure and certain that, it, that we're in the realm of the symbolic, not in the realm of the literal. Just go through the Bible and you see seven all over the place. So Jesus' first public act, his first sign, is making wine at a party. Looking at this in literal terms of a story, we might ask, why not a healing? Why not bread and fish for hungry people? After all, he's not even providing wine for a party that had no wine, but rather more and a lot more. We're talking multiple gallons of wine to keep the party going late into the night. So he's not filling a basic human need here. The opening line of this passage of our story today gives us a clue about the symbolism this wedding feast is getting at. The passage begins, on the third day. Remember how I said no detail in John is gratuitous? On the third day is an obvious foreshadowing of the resurrection, the fulfillment of God's plan for humanity the realization of the kingdom of God. Now, if you look throughout the Bible, you'll see that feasts and banquets are often used to symbolize the, the abundance of God's grace and the fulfillment of the divine plan. So in a sense, we're beginning the story of Jesus' life and ministry by looking toward the end of the story the fulfillment of his mission, when we all gather around the table at the heavenly banquet. The imagery of the heavenly banquet is central to Christian faith and worship. It's what we celebrate, what we embody and anticipate when we gather around the Lord's table every week in the celebration of the Eucharist. 
Unfortunately, we can't do it now, but uh, soon, soon we will. And as in many aspects of John's gospel story, the story of the wedding at Cana is imbued with Eucharistic imagery. Elsewhere in his gospel, Jesus speaks of, in John's gospel, Jesus speaks of being the bread of life, the true vine. And of course, there's the feeding of the multitude, which is mentioned in all four gospels. John's gospel has no account of the Last Supper. There's no, you know, account of his last, you know, uh, night with the disciples instituting the Lord's Supper. In John's gospel, he washes the disciples' feet. So there's no institution of the Eucharist in John's gospel. But rather, throughout his gospel, this Eucharistic imagery of bread and wine and this heavenly banquet is, is scattered throughout. It's not random that Jesus chose to use bread and wine to represent the heavenly banquet. He could have easily used something that grows from the earth naturally, like a fruit or vegetable. But rather, he uses food and drink that are the product of human work. The grain and the grapes grow from God's green earth, but they only become bread and wine through human intervention and a process of chemical transformation. Bread is a completely different substance from the grain that you, that's used to make it. And you can't undo bread. You can't turn it back into the grain that makes it up. And likewise, wine is no longer grape juice. It's been transformed into a different substance forever. They become new creations, as it were. New creations born from the natural processes God sets in motion and human labor working together, hand in hand. Likewise, at the wedding at Cana, we have jars, huge jars filled with water, the most basic element of human life, the element that makes up most of our body and most of the Earth's surface. Water is basic, essential, necessary for life and survival. Yet water is not celebratory. It's not festive drink fit for a banquet. But in the presence of Christ, this basic, base element becomes a festive drink to warm the heart. As I said, if we think of this in terms of wine alone, it seems trivial. But the message is not about wine or water themselves, but rather the process of transformation. In the presence of Christ, the basic inert element of water becomes a higher, more active substance, if you will. And by the way, just as an aside, wine is often used to represent the Holy Spirit in uh, the New Testament. Think of the parable of the new wine and the old wine, old wine skins, skins that can't hold that uh, uh, new wine, which represents the Holy Spirit's uh, activity. We come into this world with whatever genetic or biological baggage we inherited from our parents and ancestors. We have no control over the conditions of our birth and our formative years. And collectively, as a human family, we have no control over our fate as flesh and blood beings. We are all born, we all need to eat every day, and we all die. These are inevitable parts of the human experience. Like water, we, as a baseline, we exist here on earth. But the good news of the gospel is that in Christ we become a new creation, transformed by his life-giving presence and filled with the Holy Spirit. In the story, the clay jars don't change in appearance. 
The jars filled with wine look exactly like the jars filled with water. But the content has been transformed. Not replaced, but transformed. You notice they filled the waters, the, the jars with water. They didn't empty them and then put wine in. They filled them with water, which then became wine. It was transformed. That's the effect of the light of Christ on us and everything that light touches. Yes, we continue to be who we are in all our humanity, along with our faults and weaknesses, just as the clay jars remain the same in their appearance and form. But the light of Christ transforms us inwardly, transmuting us from the basic water of our biological existence to the spirit-filled wine of life in the kingdom of God. Amen. Let us confess the faith of our baptism in the words of the Apostles' Creed, as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the prayers of the people. We will use litany number one, found on page 110. And at this time, I would ask that uh, if you have prayer requests, prayers for healing, thanksgiving, whatever it may be, that you may submit those in the comment section online, and we will pray those together. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. From peace, for peace from one high and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our bishops, for Mary, our bishop, for Linda, our primate, for Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, for all our clergy, and especially for Archdeacon Kamara, who lost his father, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Elizabeth, our queen, for the leaders of the nations, for all those in authority, especially as we as leaders discern ways forward to come out of the pandemic, may they be guided by wisdom and concern for the common good. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this city of Beaconsfield, for the island of Montreal, for every city and community, and for those who live in them in faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
for good weather and for abundant harvest for all to share. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who travel by land, water, or air, for the sick and for the suffering, especially we remember the needs in our own parish, in our family, families and friends. We pray for Cheryl, for Janet, for Laura, for Art, for Gordon, Sandy, Deidre, Colleen, Anne, Gloria, Elena, Eleanor, Mary, and Robbie. And I ask uh, Evgeny, are there any, there are no, no prayer requests online. We lift up to you, Lord, all those needs of our community, whether they have been spoken aloud or only silently in our hearts. We pray for prisoners and captives, for their safe, safety, health, and salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction and strife and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those who have died, and for all those who grieve, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. I invite you now to uh, lift up silently any prayer concerns that you may have. Remembering all the saints, we commit ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our God, to you, O Lord. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And when you have promised through your well beloved, and you have promised through your well beloved Son, that when two or three are gathered together, you will hear their request. Fulfill now our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come eternal life. For you, Father, are good and loving, and we glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Uh, please share a sign of the peace of Christ for those in your household and online in the comment section. Peace.
Let us pray. Living God, you have revealed your Son as the Messiah. May we hear his word and follow it, and live as children of light. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And let us pray. In union, blessed Jesus, with the faithful gathered throughout the world and throughout time at every altar of your church, where your blessed body and blood are offered, we long to offer you praise and thanksgiving for creation and all the blessings of this life, for the redemption won for us by your life, death, and resurrection, for the means of grace and the hope of glory. We believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament, and since we cannot at this time receive communion, we pray to you, come into our hearts. We unite ourselves with you and embrace you with all our heart, soul, and mind. Let nothing separate us from you. Let us serve you in this life until by your grace we come to your glorious kingdom and unending peace. Amen. Now as our Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now is our time for spiritual communion meditation as uh, Sylvia plays for us. Uh, take time to turn inwardly and commune with the spirit, the light of Christ within you. And if it's helpful to you, perhaps, visualize yourself in the church, receiving the sacrament, tasting the bread, coming to the altar, to live, live in that moment internally for a bit.
and together we pray. Come, Lord Jesus, and dwell in our hearts in the fullness of your strength. May our wisdom and guide us in right pathways. Conform our lives and actions to the image of your holiness, and in the power of your gracious might, rule over every hostile power that threatens or disturbs the growth of your kingdom. Who with the Father and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. And together we pray, glory to God, who is power working in us, can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the Church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. May the God of infinite goodness scatter the darkness of sin and brighten your hearts with holiness. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you, now and forever. Amen. Announcements. Um, first of all, Coffee Fellowship will happen today at 11.15. Uh, I apologize, last week uh, there was a glitch with the Zoom link. I know there were some people who tried to get in but couldn't get in because it was sending to them to an old meeting. Uh, we're hopeful that that has been corrected. I'm pretty sure it has been. Of course, you know, you don't know until you try it, but I'm pretty sure it's, it's fine now. Uh, so the, the Zoom link was sent in the parish email, uh, and perhaps someone will post it in the comments, uh, but it's in your email from this week. And if you had trouble last week, please try again. Uh, please try again. And uh, I especially encourage you, if, you've, if you're newer to the parish, to please join us for coffee hour so we can get to know each other. I mean, we're all sitting at home. This is an excellent opportunity to, to chat and get to know each other. Um, Wednesday evening worship continues every week at 7 p.m. on Facebook Live and the website. This is a service of evening prayer or sometimes compline. Uh, if you, if you, uh, I think this is a good opportunity, good time. It's cold outside. It's, you know, if you can't go anywhere, why not add a, a weekday service to your uh, repertoire? Next Sunday, of course, we have church next Sunday in the morning. In the afternoon is the annual ecumenical. Uh, prayer service for the week of prayer for Christian unity. That's at 3 o'clock on Zoom, and the link is in the parish email. Uh, this is not just, this is important because ecumenical uh, relations with our Christian brothers and sisters, uh, whether they be other Protestants, Catholic, or Orthodox, this is very important. This is part of who we are as Christians to seek unity in the body of Christ. And it's important to me personally because I'm on the I'm the ecumenical representative for the Diocese of Montreal, and I'm on the planning committee for this service. We, we're working with a lot of restrictions because this was going to be a, a sort of in-person service broadcast online, but that changed at the last minute. So, uh, if you would like to come out and support uh, our ecumenical work as a diocese, and me and Bishop Barry will be there. Uh, please come at 3 on Zoom next Sunday. Annual Vestry is scheduled for February 20th. Uh, and if you, are, uh, if you are a head of ministry, you need to su submit your Vestry report by January 31st. Note to self, the incumbent needs to write his report as well. <laughs> uh, we don't know what format this will be I think it's likely to be on Zoom at this point, even if we're back in person worshiping, uh, but details will follow on that. We have two vacancies uh, coming up. Well, actually, we have several vacancies coming up, but first we have two vacancies on the corporation. The corporation, of course, is the small body of members that uh, runs the, the business, the, the operating aspect of the church, which consists of the priest, two uh, wardens, and two deputy wardens. We have two deputy warden positions opening up. 
so we're looking for a deputy rector's warden and a deputy people's warden. Uh, the, the only difference is the rector's warden is appointed by the priest and the people's warden is elected by the parish. Uh, if you're interested in, in uh, stepping into one of these roles, please uh, pray about it and get in touch with me or, or, uh, or Donna Gomes. And uh, it's not, deputy warden is not a huge, uh, a huge task, but it's an important one. Uh, if you think that might be something you could do, uh, please uh, speak to us. Another position that's opening up is the building manager position. This is a part-time and it's a paid position, uh, eight hours a week, so not a huge time commitment. And this, uh, basically this is the person who is responsible for our rentals, because we have a great space here. I think you all know that we have a great church building and it's uh, an asset for us, but that takes someone to, to uh, show it to prospective renters, to wedding couples, to whoever, you know. Uh, it's important, very important job. If you are interested, please speak to Donna Gomes as well. And you know, I can't tell you when we're, we're uh, going to be back in person. I had someone call this morning while we're, I was getting ready for the service asking, when will we be back in person? Your guess is as good as mine. You know, so ask ask uh, Premier Legault. You know, ask him. Uh, I'm hopeful, though. I'm feeling hopeful, and that's not something that comes naturally to me because I'm not a wild optimist by by nature. So, if I'm feeling hopeful, that's probably a good sign. Uh, I'm feeling hopeful that things are good, going to get better quickly. But we're in a bad place right now. But I got my booster on Friday, so. I hope everyone of you has either gotten your booster or will get it soon. Please, if, you, uh, if you're eligible, please get your booster vaccination as soon as possible. Because even when we are back in person, the vaccine passport is going to be with 